Good morning, giving reverence to God, who is the head of my life. I bring you greetings from the Christ Temple Baptist Church in Patterson, New Jersey. We thank God for God's greatest gift, his only begotten son, Jesus the Christ. And I am honored to be with you this morning as we celebrate the anniversary of your pastor and my pastor, amen. Pastor Weldon McWilliams Jr., we thank God for his service to this church. We thank God for his service to this community, amen. For those of you who are watching out there in the online world, if you have your Bibles, if you will turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, beginning at the fourth chapter, and we'll read the second through the fourth verse. I'll read it for you hearing one time in the King James Version, then I'll read it a second time in the New Living Translation. Amen. Chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, beginning with the second verse, and it reads this way. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. The New Living Translation reads this way, 2 Timothy 4, chapter 2, verse, preach the word of God be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming where people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Amen. And I'd like to use for a subject this morning, in season and out of season. In season and out, out of season. Paul writes this letter to Timothy to give final instructions and encourage the young pastor of the church of Ephesus. This letter is written while Paul sits in jail awaiting his execution under the Roman emperor Nero. Paul knew that his time was getting ready to come to an end. And in the first chapter of 2 Timothy, Paul's letter projects the love that he has for his mentee, Timothy. Paul also encourages the young pastor to hold on to sound doctrine and not to be influenced by foolish talk. Later on in the, le in the letter, Paul warns Timothy that there will one day soon enough be opposition that he would have to face. Paul warns Timothy that one day there will be those who will seek to use the church for their own selfish gain. There will be those within the church who will even teach false doctrine. And by the time we get to the fourth chapter of this epistle, Paul gives Timothy a stirring charge. He tells Timothy to preach the word. He says in the second verse of 2 Timothy chapter 4, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, uh, or rebuke. The New Living Translation, preach the word of God, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching for the time is coming where people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching, but rather they will follow their own desires and look for teachers who will teach them whatever it is that they want to hear, and they will reject the truth. I stopped by this morning to let you all know, and if you don't know already, I'm sure your pastor will be able to tell you that the role of pastor is not an easy one. There is much that comes with that position. The, the pastor is the one who is called by God to watch over the flock. The shepherd of the flock has the responsibility of looking after the flock and protecting the flock from hurt, harm, and danger. You must have a certain disposition about yourself to be a pastor. The mind of a pastor and the heart 
of a pastor must be one that is willing to serve. And, and, and God tells a disobedient Israel in Jeremiah 3 to come back to God. And if they come back to God, God would give Israel shepherds after God's own heart. Well, what does that mean to be after God's own heart? Well, we should all know that that does not mean that we are called to be perfect as in perfection without error. But, but to be after God's own heart, uh, what, what, it, what that means is we should seek to be in harmony with God. What is important to God is now what becomes important to you and I. What troubles God is now what begins to trouble you and I. When God says to go right, you will go right. And when God says go left, you'll go to the left. When God says stop, then you will change whatever it is that you were doing in order to stop. Amen. To be one after God's own heart means you are willing to submit your will to the will of God. You are able to submit what you may want for yourself to now what God wants of you and from you. And a good pastor understands that they have been called to lead the flock. But that good pastor also understands it is not them that is doing the leading, but it is God doing the leading God's self. This is particularly interesting in this time for the church. We are living in a particularly interesting time of the church. And studies have revealed that ever since the recession of 2008, that church attendance has been on a steady decline. Some churches have even seen as much as a 50% decline in their regular attendance. Today, we are in a particular moment where pastors have had to leave their, their congregations in the midst of a pandemic crisis. And I was telling my congregation last week that I pray that all congregants are working with their pastors and praying for their pastors. I have only been a pastor for a short time, but I still believe that I am in a similar boat with most pastors in the fact that we have not taken a class or a course on how to lead the church through a pandemic. Many of us as pastors are learning on the go and learning on the fly as we are entering into a new norm, as we are entering into a season where now congregants are not even allowed to come in to the building. Many pastors are learning on the fly. Many are being creative. Many are now pastoring in ways that they have never pastored before. And that's why it is important for you, the congregants, to pray for your pastor, to, to pray for the pastor's success in this time, because now is a time that none of us, and especially pastors, have ever learned how to lead in the midst of this before. This, this is an interesting time. This is something that I know that I have never seen in my lifetime. But there are many pastors who, in this season, in their uh, 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 testing of the waters of how to minister in this season, many pastors have been left open for criticism based on how they have led in the midst of this coronavirus. There is a type of pressure that falls on the pastor that is unlike any other. And as I said before, I haven't been a pastor too long, but it is without reservation that I can say there is a pressure that comes along with that title unlike any other title. And for many, the church is oftentimes fairly or unfairly judged by the look and the ways of the pastor. Credit and blame are oftentimes attached to the pastor of the church. The pastor is also seen as the representation, the personification of that particular church all of the time. There is never a time where the pastor can take off their title and stop being their pastor for a certain amount of time. The pastor is the pastor of that church all the time, at all times, and within all times. 
Rarely, if ever, can the pastor of the church go somewhere and be seen as someone or something outside of the church that they pastor. Amen. One of the things that I have learned on my short road as pastor is that wherever I am seen, especially in the city where my church resides, I am always pastor. Amen. My my pastors had my 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 uh, uh, collar, whether being there physically or symbolically, is always on and people will always see me as pastor. This is a pressure that I don't know if many people understand. That your pastor, that the pastor is the pastor at all times. And many times it's easy for us to underestimate or even forget that the pastor has his or her own burdens that they have to go through. But on top of that, they are indeed praying for and oftentimes bearing the burdens of many congregants within their church. The reputation of a particular church and the reputation of that particular pastor oftentimes tends to be intertwined. And it's hard for the pastor to distance, to distance himself or herself from anything that has to do with the church because they are, in fact, the overseer of that church. The pastor is also one of those assigned positions that I believe can look easier or simpler, simpler, sim more simple than it really is. I have come to find out that on this journey as pastor that, that just because you can preach, that does not mean you can pastor, amen? I've also come to find on this journey that even though you are pastor, you're gonna encounter some folks within your very own congregation who believe they can pastor better than you can, amen? I can never forget one of the things that my father has taught me and was telling me all through the preparation of me becoming, moving from minister into the pastorship position. My father would always tell me and always remind me that in pastoring, preaching is the easy part. To get up Sunday after Sunday and preach with thus saith the Lord, uh, that in itself is a part of pastoring, but that is one of the most uh, 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 regular and one of the easy parts of pastoring. Amen? Because pastoring involves something a little deeper than just preaching the word of God. Pastoring involves trying to get all different types of people and all different types of personalities, trying to get them all on one accord so that they can see the same mission that they have. And that mission is to build up the kingdom of God. I don't know how many of you out there have ever tried and ever had to try to have everybody have all different types of personalities and all different types of individuals have them all come together and come together for the same purpose. Amen. I don't know if you understand how difficult a task that can be, but that's what is involved in pastoring. Amen. Pastoring also involves with dealing with all matters of problems and all matters of attitudes and grudges and, and trying to deal with all these things and arrange all these things in such a way that the church can still move in unison and continue to move in the will of God. I've come to find out that a congregation of the church, more than one or two people, you'll have more than one or two personalities. And I come to find out that however big your church is, that's about how many different personalities that the pastor has to deal with and try to mesh. But the call of the pastor is to be the shepherd of the flock, to be the overseer of the church, and to make sure that all these folks, all these people, all these personalities are still moving on one accord and still focus on building up the kingdom of God. What I would like and what I hope we would all understand this morning is that the call of a pastor is a call that is not given by man, but it is a call that is given by God. God has given us pastors for the edifying of the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 tells us, it says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. These five ministerial positions, this five-fold ministry of which the pastor is one, these are gifts from God, and, and they all have responsibilities from God, and that responsibility is to equip 
and to spiritually strengthen the body of Christ, which is the church. God has given the shepherd, the pastor, the awesome task and responsibility to equip the saints for the edifying and the strengthening of the church. God has given the pastor the awesome responsibility of protecting the flock from the many distractions of the world. The pastor must do all that they can do to keep the flock together and move according to the will of God. But distractions have a way of separating the flock. Distractions come in all types of ways. And I just want to remind you, I want to remind you first, Baptist, that as the pastor tries to get us all on one accord, the devil is working to make sure we have things to distract us and keep us from building up the kingdom of God. Distractions come in all different types of ways. And, and the pastor oftentimes has to deal with these distractions in ways that many congregants don't deal with because whether you believe it or not, the congregants get caught up in these distractions themselves. Well, I can hear somebody asking, well, what ways do, the distra do these distractions come about? Well, distractions come about through gossip. You can't build up the kingdom of God when you know that there are members in this, this, the, in the church who are talking, who are gossiping about one another, who are talking behind the backs of one another. Distractions will come through gossip. Distractions will come through jealousy. Distractions will come through envy. Distractions will come through pride. And distractions will come through impatience. Distractions come through these various ways and the pastor has to be on lookout whenever and has to be aware of wherever these distractions may show themselves. These distractions are, are dangerous because when one member is affected and when one member of the flock is affected by the distractions, the potential for them to do harm to other members is great. I know we've heard of the saying that it only takes one rotten apple to spoil the whole bunch. And, and that is so true even in the church. All it takes is one person to, to start the gossip. And then before you know it, everybody has been participating in the gossip. All it takes is one person to, get, have, to have jealousy and pride in their heart and before you know it it becomes just as contagious as COVID-19 and it begins to trickle all throughout the congregation and the pastor's job is to make sure that he or she can catch this distraction early enough and nip it in the bud before it becomes a dangerous virus for the rest of the congregation. Yes! First Baptist, I want to encourage you to pray for your pastor for this position as pastor is a job like none other. Amen. It's a job that is like none other. It's a job that has a pressure like no other. And it is the pastor's job to make sure that they can be aware and they can find out and they can nip in the bud these distractions because whether you believe it or not, the devil's job is to distract us from doing the will of God. It's the devil's job to make sure that he can bring dissension amongst the congregation. It's the devil's job to make sure that he can bring tension and anger and jealousy in the midst of the congregation. It is the pastor's job with the grace of God to make sure that he or she does whatever is necessary to make sure those distractions do not disturb and do not distract the church from moving according to God's will. Amen. Amen. Whether you believe it or not, these are things that your pastor has to deal with. These are things that pastors have to deal with, amen? And, 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 and whether you believe it or not, I don't know any pastors that are Superman or Superwoman. They, they deal with their own particular issues. Pastors, whether you believe it or not, their whole lives are no more the church than your whole life is the church. But yes, they understand that they, through their gift given to them, through God, that they have a particular responsibility to the church, but I have yet to meet a pastor. I have yet to talk to a pastor who is not dealing with her own or his own issues. Whether you believe it or not, a pastor is not resistant to hurt. A pastor is not resistant to pain. A pastor is not resistant to stress. Amen. I have not met a pastor who has been pastoring for such a long time that they have never been weighed down, they have never been stressed out, and they've never had to go through their own pain. 
Whether you believe it or not, the title of pastor oftentimes leaves them vulnerable. It leaves us vulnerable for attack. It leaves us vulnerable for critique. It leaves us vulnerable for criticism. It leaves us vulnerable for unfair words being spoken about us. Yes, you ought to pay, pray for your preacher, pray for your pastor, because the obligation of the pastor is to preach in season and out of season. The pastor has been called to preach the message and the word of God, whether it be popular on Monday or unpopular on Tuesday. The job of the pastor is to preach a message and preach the word of God in season and out of season. And because of that call, because we are called to preach in season and out of season, yes, sometimes we'll be attacked. Yes, sometimes we'll be talked about. Yes, sometimes we'll be hurt. But yet we understand that our call is to preach the word of God in season and out of season. But not only that, I want to encourage you to pray for your pastor because I have still not met a pastor that has questioned the call on their life. And I don't know if you understand how hard it has to be if, if you are out there and you have a call on your life. I'm sure whatever that call is, you have come to a point where you've questioned whether or not this was really your call. And the same thing extends to pastors. Pastors, I believe, oftentimes wonder if the call that is on their life was the right call. They, they oftentimes wonder if they heard God correctly, if they really did get that call to preach, if they really did get that call to pastor. And, and they always wonder had they heard the Lord correctly. Because on this journey, on this pastoring journey, there's going to be a time where they even doubt themselves. I know that on my short journey as pastor, there's been times where I've even doubted whether or not this was really the call that God has placed on my life. And I know Pastor McWilliams, who's been here 48 years, is wondering if, 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 if I know there were times where he had wondered whether or not this was indeed the call on his life. And I want you to pray for your pastor because that could be a hard thing to simultaneously have to lead a flock of God's children while at the same time questioning whether or not this was really the call on your life. But I have not met a pastor who has been pastoring for a, 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 a period of time and they have not been weighed down at the thought that maybe God had gotten it wrong or maybe they had even gotten it wrong. Maybe God was saying pray instead of preach. Maybe God was saying teach instead of pastor. Maybe these duties and these responsibilities that, that have now been thrusted upon me, it can weigh somebody down. But I want you to pray for your pastor because to preach in season and to preach out of season can be a stressful thing. To preach in season and to preach out of season can be something that can bring hurt even to their lives. But pastors in particular are dealing, pastors if you look at the numbers are disproportionately dealing with stress, disproportionately when you look at the rest of the population, suicides among pastors are disproportionate to suicides amongst others in the world. And, and this world that we live in, with all of its distractions, has been at odds with the job of the church. The church's job is to tell a dying world that there is a savior who can save those who are lost. And that there is a light that can brighten up even the darkest places of your life. But you have to understand we live in a world that has uh, uh, oftentimes and constantly has been trying to be at odds with the job of the church. The church is to tell the dying world that there is a savior, but the world is out there telling the rest of the world that you only have one life to live and you ought to give and do what you can do right now. But I stopped by to tell somebody that I'm living this life just so I can live again. I am reminded that one of these days I will have to take off this body and put on a new body that is made to live forever. So I want you to understand that yes, I want you to pray for your pastor because your pastor has to preach in season and out of season. The, the pastor has to preach whether it's popular or unpopular. The pastor has to preach whether it will get him or her likes or whether it will get him dislikes. Your pastor has to preach whether it will gain him or her favor or whether they will get unfavored. I just stopped by to tell you, you ought to pray for your pastor because the pastor is the one that has to remind you over and over again, even in your darkest moments, that God is able to do anything. It's the pastor that will remind you when you go through what you go through that you got to learn to trust 
and depend on Jesus. It's the pastor that will remind you when you're going through what you're going through that you got to put your hands in the hands of the man who stilled the waters and who calmed the sea. Yes, it's your pastor who has the obligation and the responsibility to tell you, church, that we are called to be examples for this dying world. And we got to live that way in season and out of season. Yes, it is your pastor who will tell you, church, not what you want to hear, but they will tell you, your pastor ought to tell you what you need to hear. And what your pastor will tell you is that even though you may not have everything you want, if you keep your hand in God's hand, God will make sure you have everything that you need. Yes, despite the gossip, despite the conflict, the pastor has to keep preaching that word of life. Pray for your pastor because your pastor has to preach in season and out of season. Despite the gossip, despite the lies, despite the frowns, despite the smiles, your pastor has to preach in season and out of season. And this is why Paul is encouraging Timothy. Timothy is a young preacher. Timothy is just moving into the pastorship. Paul, who's coming to the end of his ministry, is telling Timothy, you got to preach in season and out of season. That on this journey, there's going to be a, a, a time where things get rough, where the road gets rocky, where there will be those who will throw stumbling blocks in your way. But Paul says, despite that, preach in season and out of season. There's going to come a time where people won't like what you're preaching. They won't accept what you're preaching and they'll rather hear something else. But Paul is encouraging Timothy to preach in season and out of season. And that's why I'm thankful for your pastor. I'm thankful for my pastor, Pastor McWilliams, because through the years, he has reminded me over and over again that I got to preach in season and out of season. And don't get caught up by the applause, for the applause is temporary. The same ones who clap for you today will talk about you tomorrow. But if you preach in season and out of season, then you can look at God, you can look in the mirror, you can look to God and say, you've done what you were able and what you were called to do. Amen. Preach in season. Preach out of season. Pastors, the question will come to us, have we stayed true to the call? Have we stayed true to the call? Have we stayed the fight? Have we preached in season and out of season? Pray for your pastor. I know that God is still watching me. I know God is over me. But for Pastor McWilliams to be in it for over 40 years, you have to understand that this is not a small feat. To be committed to anyone or to anything for the amount of time that he has been committed to this church, that could have only been God in the midst. Amen. But I stopped by to tell somebody you ought to pray for your pastor and pray that they will preach in season and preach out of season. And I pray and I know that God is watching me and, and I'm encouraged because even as I preach in my ups and in my downs, I know God is looking out for me. As the pastor preaches in his ups or in her ups or in their downs, they know God is looking out. Even when I preach a word that the people may not want to hear, if it comes from God, then God is looking out for me. We got to preach in season and out of season and I'm encouraged as I think about what Paul was trying to tell Timothy. I'm encouraged as I think about the message that Paul wanted Timothy to know that you gotta preach in season and out of season. I'm encouraged to preach the word today. Whether they like it or not, I gotta tell somebody that God is love. Whether they like it or not, I gotta tell somebody that God is forgiveness. Whether you like it or not, I gotta tell somebody that God is your strength, even in the midst of your weakness. God is joy, of sadness. God is your power. God is your healer even in the midst of sickness. God is my peace even in the midst of conflict. I'm encouraged because I understand that God is my all in all. I got to preach it in season and out of season. Why? Because God continues to bless me. God continues to hold me and talk to me and comfort me, walk with me and talk with me and I thank God for all that God continues to do in my life. Pray for your pastor. Pray that your pastor has the strength to endure and to preach the word in season and out of season. For it's the preaching of the word that will draw you near. It's the preaching of the word that will bring you in relationship with Christ. It's the preaching of the word that will show you that through Christ you can do all things that strengthens you. 
This is what we need in this day and time. We need preachers who are going to preach the word, whether it draws them popularity or whether it makes them popular, whether it gets them favor in the world or whether it draws unfavor in the world. We are not going and we are not living by the standards of the world. We are living by a greater standard. I want to do what God wants me to do, regardless of what the world wants me to do. And your pastor has to preach the word that God gives God. God gives him. God has to, uh, the pastor has to preach the word that God has given them, whether the congregation likes it or not, whether the congregation is moved by it or not. I want you to pray for your pastor. Pray that they have the strength to preach in season and out of season. For it's in the preaching, amen, it's in the preaching that our church family, that uh, our believers, we as believers are strengthened and we are edified. This is what it's called for. This is what this time is calling for. In the midst of this pandemic, where there's so much uncertainty, in the midst of this pandemic, where people are trying to still figure out how to get back to a place of normalcy, I just want to tell somebody the days of normal are gone. Matter of fact, normalcy might have brought us in this predicament in the first place. What we have to figure out now is how we can move forward. Pray for your pastor. God is going to give your pastor word. And your pastor is going to give that word to you. And if there's anything, we, there's a way that we can go about it. Now, I, I'm not under any delusion. I know that there's times and there's places where uh, there will be times and places where the pastor is not even favorable among his or her own congregation. That's when you got to pray for your pastor the most. Not when you are in agreement, but when you disagree. Pray that God will reveal to the pastor whatever God needs to reveal and pray that God will reveal to you whatever it is that you need. God is good. And in this pastoral anniversary, I believe that nothing will bring your pastor more joy than to know that he has a congregation that prays for him constantly, that he has a congregation that is praying that he, for his strength constantly. That's what preachers are, that's what pastors are looking for. They don't always, they know that they won't always be popular. They know that they will rarely get 100% agreement with the congregation, but they hope and pray that their congregants will pray for them. I know I pray that my congregants, whether they like me or not, I pray that they pray for me. And uh, I believe that Pastor McWilliams, one of the greatest gifts you as a congregant can give your pastor is to pray for him on a regular basis. Pray his strength. Pray that whatever God is trying to reveal to him, that he will be obedient to what that word is and that he will share it with you. Amen. And pray that God will give you the strength to put your trust in the pastor. And if you put your trust in the pastor and pray that the pastor's trust is in God, whether you believe it or not, all things will work out. Scripture says all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. God is good. God is great. And on this pastor's anniversary, I just want to say thank you, Pastor McWilliams, for your leadership here at First Baptist Church. Thank you for your leadership here in the village of Spring Valley. Thank you for your leadership in my life. I thank you for the many nuggets of knowledge that you have dropped into me in my life. We're grateful. Thank you. The congregation loves you. The congregation prays for you. Hopefully we'll pray. And if you haven't been praying for your pastor, I pray that today you can start anew. Where you can pray and pray for your pastor regularly. And just pray, not even just for the pastor, but pray for this branch of Zion called First Baptist Church. As the pastor is edified, as the church is edified, then we all can edify and build up this kingdom of God. Amen. I just want to briefly open up the doors of the church. I just want to take the opportunity. And I don't want to take for granted that there might be somebody here watching right now who may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that is your story and you feel that burning inside of you that is telling you and trying to convince you to start your relationship or, or recommence your relationship with Jesus, I just want you to accept that nagging, that burning feeling right now. 
Although the doors of the church may be closed, you don't have to be in the church to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you do accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and you want to make First Baptist Church your church home, I'm just going to ask that if you just put that in the comment box. The first thing you have to do is you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ. That's how you uh, uh, come to Christ and you confess that you believe that Jesus is the Christ and you believe this in your heart. And if you have done that, and if you want to make Jesus your Savior, and if you want to come into relationship with Jesus, and you want to do that while being a member of the First Baptist Church of Spring Valley, New York, just put a comment in the comment box. And I promise you somebody will get in contact with you, and somebody will tell you how we can move forward into making sure that that membership, that relationship between you and church comes to pass. Amen. God is good. God is a great God. God is a good God. We ought to give God praise for you, give God praise for this church, but give God praise for your pastor, for the years that he's been here, for the decades that he's been here preaching what thus saith the Lord, for the years and for the decades he's been here impacting lives right here at First Baptist Church and in the village of Spring Valley. We give God praise for the gift of Reverend Weldon McWilliams Jr. We thank God for what he has done and what he continues to do. Pray for your pastor and pray that God will give him all that he needs so that he can be encouraged to preach in season and out of season. God bless you and heaven smile upon you. Good morning to my good, good members and my friends and also my enemies. I want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I also want to thank God for allowing me to serve this church for 48 years. It's been a blessing. And I must say, these people are the best members that anybody can have. I thank God for working with me. We did a lot in 48 years, and I believe that a lot more will be done. I ask you to continue to work whoever God sends here. Work with them and hold on to God's unchanging hand. I want to also give a shout out to our deacon for being good deacons, to our trustees, and also to our choirs and our directors, I want to thank you for your support down through the years. I want to thank you for not uh, debating all the time with your pastor, but walking with your pastor, talking with your pastor, because I believe what the Word says, whatever comes before us, we can and we shall overcome. I want you to continue to uh, bless this Sunday school. I thank God for the work that our sister Bessie Walker has been doing down through the years. I thank God for her devotion. I thank God for her. I thank God for the Sunday school lesson that we had on, on Palm Sunday and had on Resurrection Sunday. All I just want you to say, keep on walking, keep on trusting, keep on believing, because like I said many days, God's grace is sufficient. God bless you, and heaven smile upon you.